when did you start Life is Living and what pushed you to start that? The first Life is Living Festival was in 2008 um, here in the city of Oakland. Um, working with Youth Speaks, um, we worked with the artist and activist Robert Redford for a number of years who um, created a space for us within the context of our National Poetry Festival to do a reading that was just about um, environment that asked young people to um, create poems at the intersection of their personal environment and the physical environment. Um, um, these were incredibly successful and um, Robert took a couple of the young poets and invited um, them to come with him to national and international um, forums um, and conferences um, rooted in environmental action. The thing was, wherever we went, these young poets who were often, um, you know, certainly under the age of 19 and generally of color were the only young brown people at these conferences. So as we all know, um, the environmental movement cannot be a segregated movement, right? The environmental movement is for earthlings, right? <laughs> Um, we're talking about the planet, and so um, you know the the messaging, the iconography, and and um, the internalization of environmental messages um, might have felt one way in these kind of public spaces. And the poets, you know, they would open up for Bill Clinton or you know Bishop Desmond Tutu, right? Um, but there, but we we would come back home. I would come back home to Oakland and didn't see that space. The first um, event that we threw was called. Um, um, red, black, and green, an environmental caucus, and I don't know, it had, there was colon. <laughs> so I was like, it was just like that. <laughs> um, um, but most deaf performed at our first, um, at our first uh, concert in West Oakland at, at Little Bobby Hutton Park or, or Defermary Park, and you know, it was a massive artistic success. Um, but as I noted, it, it um, fell short in terms of any kind of sustained um, movement. Um, and so what we realized was that um, the best thing that we could do, particularly me who travels to different cities um, in, in making this work happen, the best thing that we could do isn't to develop a, um, a, a show, it was to develop a small, um, compassionate army of folks who could network together, that the, that the ecologies that we were actually seeking to disrupt or to um, elevate were um, the social ecologies on the ground. And um, so I think that the pedagogy of Life is Living is way more important and impactful than the festivals themselves. And do we have a center here in Oakland or San Francisco? How many cities around this uh, country are, do we have Life is Living in? We had uh, Life is Living festivals in Atlanta and Philadelphia this year, and on Saturday, October 10th, Life is Living will be in Little Bobby Hutton Park. Um, so, about two months from now. Thank or you. I guess six weeks from now. Yeah. Okay, great. Right. I just wanted to ask how does the pedagogy of Life is Living live beyond the festival itself? Um, that's a that's a great question. Every every month, folks gather at Little Bobby Hutton Park, um, very specifically, and you know crowds of about this size, um, representing different constituencies. So think of your chamber of commerce, or think of Nasdaq, or you know just any place where um, people or folks of um, uh, great agency gather. Um, you know we tend not to do as much um, of this gathering space. Um, that isn't market-based in our communities, and, um, and, and maybe not just in um, specific demographic communities, but in any community. You know, we tend to gather around um, action and products and less around um, thought and idea sharing, which is part of what makes Creative Mornings and, you know, and forms like this so formidable. Um, so, though the festival happens in October, the second Saturday in October every year, every month, um, folks are folks are gathering very specifically to exchange these ideas in anticipation of the festival, but more likely in terms of economic and environmental um, growth and health. What kind of, especially when you're in a city, like if you're in Philadelphia or you're in Atlanta or you're not at home, mm -hmm. what kind of outreach do you do to make sure 
that the festival is representative or that the audience for the festival, that it feels accessible to people in the surrounding community? How do you make it like not a pretentious, precious art thing? Sure, you know? sure, sure, pretentious, precious art. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, we look for what I like to call the mayor of the city. Um, in Washington, D.C., that, you know, that's where you see Baraka. In uh, Philadelphia, that's uh, Janine. In Atlanta, that's Natalie Cook. Basically, we um, find a Cheney Taint Turner or a Shanaka Hodge, right? Like, we, you know, we, we, um, locate the person that, um, uh, like a squid, <laughs> has um, enough tentacles to get us started in terms of a hub. We also um, uh, partner with four different kind of cornerstone agencies. So we look for an academic institution, we look for an environmental partner, um, we look for an artistic partner, um, environment, art, academics, and we look for a funder that can, right? <laughs> um, and we look for a philanthropic partner. So we start with those four and then we put the mayor at the center. Um, and so let's say in the case of Houston, um, uh, we had the University of Houston, um, we had Project Bro Houses in Third Ward, um, we had the Houston Arts Alliance, um, and then in that case, um, Rick Lowe and Shannon Bugs were kind of the mayors. Right? And we started hosting our meetings at Project Row Houses in Third Ward, which was right across the street from Emancipation Park where we, um, where we held our festival. Um, so, you know, we kind of impart the pedagogy and we impart the ideas, um, but ultimately you have to seek, I think, partners that are capable of carrying on without you. So none of this works unless the folks on the ground are doing the work. Now, how do you ensure it doesn't become whatever, um, you don't, um, but that's also, I think, part of the strength of the pedagogy is that it is meant to become what it is supposed to become wherever it is. Now, um, we do work in um, typically under-resourced neighborhoods, and um, we choose our parks by design. There's, there's some kind of historical significance, so Little Bobby Hutton Park in West Oakland is where the Black Panthers marched and where the Free Breakfast um, Program first flourish. Um, um, it was in a historically under-resourced or uh, neighborhood. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I just, I say was, I use the past tense to also foreshadow that it's, you know, this will be the ninth year of the festival and it's probably time to move to East Oakland. But that's another story. <laughs> so it, it will be what it will be. I, I know, I, I hope that yeah. gives you somewhat of a sense. Can you say what parks in Oakland you've affected and what the effect physically was in those parks. If you were in Little Bobby Hutton Park eight years ago, you probably were breaking your ankle. Like, I think I still have tendonitis in my <laughs> left knee, seriously, from like, in the gopher hole. So, I mean, I wouldn't take direct credit, but I would say that the Life is Living Festival brought enough energy to the park that um, the city has recently um, um, allocated more than six figures for the specific improvement of that park. So there's a new basketball court. You know, at first it was like a new tennis court. Um, right? That was, like in, that was like in year three. Um, but now as we enter year nine, there's a new skate park, town park. There's, um, uh, there's been a um, kind of a, a raising and revitalization of the grasses themselves. There's a new basketball court, the historic home um, that the, um, uh, the, the ship magnate to firm we first lived in is also being considerably improved or revitalized. And, and again, I wouldn't say as a direct result, but I would say that bringing a few thousand people to the park with dramatic action has kind of elevated the visibility um, in terms of um, kind of the electoral consciousness. You mentioned that we feel like it might be time to start moving the event to East Oakland. Yeah. And you're talking about like bringing energy to a place and gathering an event. And I'm just wondering how you cope with the feeling that the energy that you bring to a place that helps to revitalize and bring energy to it and develop it no longer serves the people, perhaps, that you 
Yeah. How do I personally cope? How do you cope, or what do you what are your thoughts on it? Just... Yeah, you know, um, so uh, my son is 13, my girl is 10. I get that at the point they won't need, like if I do my job right, they won't need me, you know? Hopefully in a few years, hopefully really soon. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's the thing about um, you know, action-oriented art practices or just activism in general. So many of us define ourselves by our activism, or maybe more um, precisely, we define ourselves by our struggle. And so then what happens when you win? And I think most of us in consciousness, in imagination, in ambition, um, are, are just not psychologically prepared to win. Um, but if we're doing the work, we should. And then we move on. Um, not move on from um, kind of the, the emotional import or um, you know, the inspiration that kind of um, propelled the struggle to begin with, but you move to another physical location or you move to another um, demographic community or another psychographic community, right? Um, when, I, when I left Youth Speaks three years ago, almost four years ago, um, and I took the job first as Director of Performing Arts at your Buena Center, um, folks said, so are you gonna, one, are you gonna stop being an artist, they asked me, and you know, two, like, are you cool, like, you know? And um, this is, the, the curation of safe space to facilitate change is my artistic practice. The poems and the dances are cool under lights, but that's um, emblem. That is um, heirloom or manifestation for others. The practice is the process, if that makes sense. Um, and I wasn't, I, I didn't have to give up the practice. As a matter of fact, I was able to integrate the practice into the mores and processes of Yerba Buena Center for the Arts. And I didn't have to change my values, right? So similarly, moving from West Oakland to East Oakland, or moving from East Oakland to the north side of Chicago, or wherever it is that we are, um, doesn't involve the abandoning of the values. It's an acknowledgement that we have something that works, um, at, at least at its scale, at least to its degree, and that shouldn't be something that gets shuttered or sequestered for politics' sake. I thought it was really interesting that you put uh, Black Lives Matters in the context of hip hop, which was kind of created very intentionally through marketing and everything. So a lot of the grassroots, maybe that same approach of like making pop culture doesn't work the same way. So what does the grassroots need to really become a mainstream, like mainstay kind of like hip hop or like the tropes that you were talking about? I think that there's, um, I think it's already happened. Um, there, there are two sides to an equation that I'll, and, you know, my poor kid, like I just talk about my son incessantly, mostly because, I don't know, he's the reason, he's the reason yeah. for like everything. Um, he's reading um, Coates' book, uh, Between the World and Me. We're actually sitting down reading it together. And, you know, he just has some questions about um, the reality of oppositional race politics. Because he lives in Oakland, and you know he's he comes from a multiracial family. Everybody in my household is Asian, but me. But we're also all black, you know. So he's like, race? What's the big deal? Like, really, you know? Um, but but as he's reading this literature, and as he's seeing um, the images that are you know flashed across multiple screens, as that. Um, as those images um, shape the consciousness of the entire country, the politics, the understanding, um, kind of the cultural ambitions of our next generation, um, as we revisit after 10 years um, Hurricane Katrina and the aftermath, as we um, 
kind of usher out Barack Obama, right? Barack Obama, when I said that, you know, that in the best cases, scaled art or art scales itself as law, Obama's what I'm talking about, right? Um, Obama is the product of hip hop culture kind of coming to roost, right? So in, in this way, the images of this particular cultural moment will impact um, the electorate and I believe will impact hopefully our economic understanding of the necessity of, of interdependence in a major way. The work has actually already been done. Our job, maybe our responsibility, um, is to sustain that work with, I think, as many emblems of beauty and aesthetic promise as possible so that the work is palatable in a different kind of way. Um, lastly, I would say that um, in its initiation, hip hop was not pop culture, right? Capitalism has used hip hop as an instrument to sell the worst parts of American existence, violence, misogyny, sexism, etc., hyper-capitalism like this. Um, but hip hop as culture is manifest in my body, right? And I don't um, feel pop, you know. <laughs> I really appreciated how you spoke to the importance of partnerships. And what I'm seeing in the room are a bunch of people who could partner with you. I'm kind of curious, what, what, is, what is your picture of partnership with us? Okay. <laughs> so, um, we've taken this idea of the creative ecosystem specifically to think about the Life is Living Festival or to kind of um, serve as a channel in the city of Oakland and the creative ecosystem, um, and we've integrated, integrated it into our practices at Yerba Buena Center. So, full disclosure. Um, you know, um, we cannot waste this cultural moment. We cannot, right? And the leaders at Yerba Buena Center um, believe in the cultural agency of the enterprise of having brick and mortar in downtown San Francisco in 2015 and beyond. Um, we have incredible spaces, and at this point in time, we have significant resources very specifically to facilitate partnership and collaboration in an artful way towards the manifestation of certain values, values that are driven by questions of the design of the urban future, of place, of ecology, of economy, like this, um, of labor. So one of the best ways that we all could partner in this room is to um, accept my invitation to come to your Buena Center to be part of um, a formal creative ecosystem. Um, and I can um, talk a little bit more um, about that to you individually. Um, but I, I would say two things. One, go to ybca.org. Um, two, go to bamuti.com. Um, learn a little bit more about um, these processes that I'm talking about, but, I, I, you know, I, um, I guess follow me on Twitters, right? I don't know how to say, or just email me. There you go, just email me, and we'll get you involved. Um, or maybe the last thing I would say, thanks, the last thing I would say is that um, the, the process of doing Life is Living has been captured in a performed theatrical documentary. Um, and that's called Red, Black, and Green, a Blues. And we have our final shows um, in San Francisco in a couple of weeks at Z Space. So you can grab a flyer, um, and that's another way to find me. So either email me, mjoseph at ybca.org, come to the show, follow me on Twitter, like all those things. Find me, and we'll, and we'll plug in. You touched on a little bit of what I'm thinking about in this last question, but um, I'll state the obvious, I'm a white person. And um, I think, you know, often the elephant in the room for me is how do I consciously ally, and I realize that's a very loaded word, so um, that may or may not be the word, but the intention is behind it. Um, consciously ally and be in right partnership and in right ecology. Um, with the work you're doing um, and the different platforms and ecologies that I am moving in and out of. Um, how do you um, call um, different partners to action in this way? And are there ways that 
we can do that in right relationship. Yeah, you know, quite frankly, I'm not super interested in racial essentialism. Like, I don't, um, you know, I know I've spoken a lot about black joy. Um, and I feel like we have to call, we have to use the modifier because of what kind of um, the center of consciousness is or the center of demographic consciousness is in this country, the long history of subjugation, of people. So um, given all that, um, I, I, I locate black joy in my vocabulary or, or I talk about the matter of black life very specifically to affirm um, what has historically been a, a subjugated or under-recognized or, or under-spoken reality. That being said, um, I want a great planet. And so um, that requires safe space for specific uh, demographic interaction. And probably more than that, um, once a certain modicum of health um, and understanding and self-knowledge has been realized and, and is, is in practice, once self-affirmation is a given, um, I hope for the dissolution of borders and boundaries that separate us. Ultimately, I think that we together are um, more helpful and more helpful if the boundaries between us are essentially porous. That there's a, that there's, um, a respect among us to um, identify what needs to happen kind of in-house, like in my family structure. But you know, if the neighborhood is a microcosm, I have to make sure my house is in order, but that doesn't stop me from you know, loving you know, the person next, well, I actually don't love my next door neighbor, but, but anyway, <laughs> you, you get the point. You get the point, that, that um, it's dangerous, to, I think, to get too caught up in, um, in essential attitudes around race, or class, or gender. That um, maybe one of the best ways that we can be in partnership is to be in um, kind of respectful relationship of the safe space that we all need in order to do the work. But the planet will not survive, or the planet will survive. The people on the planet will not survive unless we're in right interdependent relationships. So the things that we do individually, collectively, and across perceived you know, borders and boundaries of demographics, those things that we do, that's what's going to heal us. And that's like so Oakland and so Kumbaya, but it's actually like hella now. You know what I mean? So just like there isn't time to like belittle the other for having um, lofty values, like there just isn't time, the sea levels are rising, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, there's this point of intersection where the change in climate and our changing cities, the, the income inequality in our changing cities are moving towards critical mass. We haven't already passed it. So I don't have time to diss you, you know what I mean? Um, all we have time for really is to grow together and to recognize the safe spaces that we need in order for that growth to happen.